Hi, this is Barry Cole with Spot Music and MalteseFalcon.com. You're watching Mubu TV, music business television. Hi, we're coming to you live from Sync Summit 2015 here in Santa Monica. And we managed to catch up with Jamie Talbot, artist manager from Sheraton Entertainment. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, I really Rich. It. Pleasure to be here. You know, you've worked in management for a long time, and I'm curious, in, in, in that scope of time today, how do you define the role of an artist manager? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I constantly have to sort of reconfigure that every day uh, in, my, in my role. Uh, as you know, the, the business is changing in so many ways in the last 10 years, especially in the last couple years. So, you know, we, it's still at the end of the day, we're still the biggest cheerleader for our artists. I think uh, whether that's finding something new and trying to put the pieces together to, to bring it along and incubate it, or taking something that's more established with a sales base or a fan base and sort of kind of moving in and dusting off that brand name and polishing it up and making it even better and stronger and, and reconnecting with with an audience that may be familiar or, or a new audience that needs to uh, sort of uh, to you know find out about this artist that maybe has been around for a while but they didn't really know who they were okay can i break that down with yes, you, you can. can i have you talk about the challenges of each sure. the challenges of a new artist because they're totally different challenges sure. than sure. it is with the re sure. resurrecting someone. well i think um you know, when you're dealing with, again, we'll start with the Establish Acts. Uh, you know, my company's been very successful at sort of managing brands, uh, whether that's Fleetwood Mac or ZZ Top or Rat or Filter or Motley Crue or Lone Star. And uh, sort of across the genres, I think you have a situation where uh, maybe we weren't the first manager in, a, in an artist's career, or maybe even the second, but where we are with them today is what can we do with, with a band in today's landscape. And uh, so when you're talking about a band that has maybe a platinum sales base, and uh, maybe is a, has a very big uh, uh, live following, uh, we like to try to, you know, where, where can we take them out of the box that they haven't really been uh, present? Maybe it's breaking into a new international market, maybe it's been exposing them uh, to do different products, Products in the merchandising world, uh, licenses and syncs, uh, soundtracks, different things like that. Um, sometimes it's changing up the live show, sometimes it's reinvigorating the catalog. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with a, with a, with a band that's been around for a while, clearly, right. um, which is very the, the antithesis of, of a band that is starting to break, uh, where you're trying to, you know, fan a little flame, maybe. Um, if you have a little, uh, if you have a new artist that maybe you've seen live that you like, or you're catching some of the media uh, from the socials, there's a lot of views on the video, there's a lot of tweets, there's sort of an underground bubbling of an artist. You have to see, okay, so where can you take this artist? Because in the, in the beginning of a, a new artist, there's not a lot of money to be made for a manager. You have to take a lot of time and investment uh, into that artist, which of course takes time away from artists that are making money. So we have to be very careful uh, and very particular about breaking a new act because we don't want to spend a lot of time and money on something and energy that may not break. So we have to be very particular. And so when we do that, we're trying to find the right artists that fit our template or the template of today. You know, is it, uh, is it, do they have a video that's getting a lot of views? Do they have a lot of, uh, you know, social following on their networks? Is it uh, something blowing up that's maybe not uh, as tangible as, uh, you know, a hit song on the radio yet because they're not signed? So we try just to find out where we can develop them. Maybe we can pair them with an artist already on our roster and sort of have them sort of bleed into that audience. You know, if it's a country act that we're trying to develop, maybe we pair it with a country act that's already established, mm -hmm. um, and so on. It, depending on the genre, you know, different genres respond differently. Uh, you know, harder edge music is more about a lifestyle, and going to the live show and enveloping yourself in the merchandise and the lifestyle, and maybe buying special product. Uh, whereas if you, you, you sort of move away from harder music, and country and pop is really about radio and getting radio exposure. Uh, people aren't really interested in the you know fifty dollar special package from the label. Uh, they just want the song. They just want to buy a ticket. Um, and then, of course, what's become really popular for the established acts is uh, you know the experience. 
Everybody wants access. Yeah. They want a special ticket, they want a special pass, they want a special item of merchandise, they want a special piece of music that's maybe not available. So um, it's all really about just, you know, being at the top of that pyramid and the foundation of everything falls under that and we're just trying to govern and direct all the different facets uh, and how to make that happen. You know, in listening to you, one of the things that comes to mind when we talk about brand new artists is I'm curious from your point of view as a manager because you stress the amount of time, which is a really important component, okay? Because there's not a lot of money and you have to balance when you work at a company between the two. So I'm curious from your point of view as a manager, Jamie, what are the qualities that you're looking for in an artist beyond great music, beyond you know the artistic sense? What are the personal qualities that you're looking for in someone that you're willing to take on or not take on? Yeah. Well, uh, again, it, it, it's hard. I don't, I don't think I ever wake up going, hey, what kind of artist am I going to sign today? Sometimes you just sort of get hit with it. It could be a song. Okay. It could be uh, something you hear or read about. You want to get in touch with that artist without even ever hearing any music. It could just be, well, I've never heard a note from this artist, but just reading this article or reading what people are saying about them, sounds like this artist really has something to say. So sometimes we'll infiltrate uh, a camp just based on something we hear without music. Uh, most of the time it is music. We hear a, a track or we, or we see a song live or we hear a performance. Uh, you know, and, and you know, the development side from the label has really gone away. I think that's one of the biggest differences uh, that you could say about developing acts in the last, you know, for sure 10, maybe even longer. Yeah. But, you know, everybody talks about this, but tour support was, was a very key component that is basically no longer existent in any record deal. Um, at least that I've been aware of in the past year. So when, it, when a young band starts and they bring in, in a label, a lot of times now where they're trying to do a 360 deal or a 180 deal where all the well, elements that used to be separated are now kind of wrapped up into one, which can be a plus and a minus. But for developing an artist, again, this comes back to the time thing. How much time, energy, and, and manpower can we spend developing it? If we feel that there's a great song, if we feel that there's a great live show, if we feel that there's a great marketing uh, component to it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll spend some real time and energy trying to peel back the layers and find out, you know, maybe it's a six-month trial. You know, sometimes we do that. Hey, let's, you know, we'll sign you for six months. We'll see what happens. If, uh, you know, neither of us are happy at, at the end of six months, you can go and we can go and we'll just call it a day. Um, you know, there's a lot of scenarios out there where managers are being hired sort of like uh, as a, on a retainer basis where you can get hired and uh, like a publicist might get paid for a two or three month campaign. Uh, we've entertained some situations like that and have had some success with that and, and not some success, but, and then that will grow into a more traditional management deal. But again, the, the spark can come in from anywhere, as you know, whether it's from a, an A&R uh, label, uh, trying to find a manager, an attorney referring somebody, you're being at a live club, hearing it from a friend, seeing it on YouTube, uh, something's blowing up on Facebook or Instagram. I mean, there's, there's so much coming at you every day. You know, there's a great saying that I once heard, I think it's not what you miss in life, it's what you catch. And you can't possibly absorb all the music that's being thrown at you in the music business every day or all the information or whatever. So you just sort of have to, you know, you have your little uh, circle of friends per se and your referrals and the people that you trust and the, your contacts, agents, managers, lawyers, record companies, friends. And you, they just come in and, you know, hopefully every once in a while you hear something that's great and uh, you may miss 10 or 12 things that are great, but you, you just can't catch them all. And, and as a manager, um, you know, you just don't have the time anyway, because if your acts get so big, you, 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 you know, you're lucky if you have one great act, right? So, I mean, we're fortunate at our company to have several acts that do very well, but we have enough personnel in two offices. But I mean, you know, if you're, for example, U2's manager, you can't do, you know, like, Mr. McGinnis couldn't do more than manage you too, nor would we want him to. Right. Uh, or if you're managing something so big, I mean, we all can't be so lucky as to manage that, but some of the larger acts we have take up an awful lot of time and bandwidth uh, from our office and staff, and, and, and so we spend a lot of time on those, and um, you know, we have a few focus acts that we spend time on, but there's also uh, you know, a team that's trying to develop some things and coming up, and we try to cross those over and pull a few favors here. And, See if we can lily pad 
the, the new young acts onto something. Let me ask you from the other point of view in terms of being an artist. There's so many artists out there who watch our show who you know want to know, and I'll ask you, what are the things they can do to attract management? What are the things that, that they can be doing to get the attention of management? I mean, not gimmicks or things, but the things that like you know you're looking for from an artist out there today. Well, you know, again, another great saying is build it and they will come, uh, which I tell to people all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so many different ways today, as opposed to 20 or 30 years ago, that an artist can build themselves and make themselves known. Okay. Um, you know, I think primarily, you know, when, when I was growing up in the business, you would get all of your information from two or three media sources. You know, you'd have to go to the record store and look at the chart and see what the new releases are. You'd have to read one or two publications, maybe it was Rolling Stone or Billboard. You know, now there's hundreds of blogs and hundreds of websites and hundreds of online publications, so it's impossible to keep track of what's coming out. You don't even know what you like and what you don't like anymore. Your favorite band may have had a record out and you, you don't even know it. Um, so, you know, the tools that are available to young artists, again, are infinite. You know, with, with the internet, with the computers and technology, people can write and record a whole record in their home. They don't need the, the confines of the studio, they don't need the expenses. Mm -hmm. So that makes it great for people looking for opportunity. So there's a lot of opportunity for bands to expose themselves, but there's also now a lot of shit to sift through because the sieve is so big. Like I mentioned before, you can't possibly get to everything. So I think artists are learning to be self-contained sooner than I would say 10 or 20 years ago because the, the paradigm and the, and the ideology was put a band together, rehearse, go play shows, get exposed, get written about, have the NR people come and see you, get signed, boom. Like it, there was a bit of a formula there mm -hmm. and that applied to rock or pop or R&B. Um, sure, everybody has a great song, but if you didn't have a great song, you know, we could find you a great song, you know, the writers, right? So people are learning to write and record earlier. Uh, people are learning to tour earlier. Uh, people are learning to take their money. Um, you know, one of, one of the, uh, I think one of the game changers of late has been uh, crowdfunding, where an artist that has a fan base can basically raise money to do whatever they want. If they uh, have a fan base that's big enough, they can raise money to record a record, they could raise money to buy a van, they could raise money to print t-shirts. Um, we've seen this again with developing acts and, and, and super established acts now. Uh, in fact, one of my clients I'm working on in conjunction with the label, a pledge campaign. So we're, we're helping uh, set up the pre-sale for the album. Mm -hmm. We're giving the fans the opportunity to buy the album first. We're giving the fans the opportunity to have something exclusive and special. Uh, from the campaign, and, and I think when, they, when crowdfunding first came out, people were looking at it like, oh, I, you know, I'm begging for money, but really you're not, because you're, you're, you're going right to the fan now. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes hand in hand with the other game changer, which is the transparency that's available now between the artist and the fan. Uh, whereas before, you know, when we started in the business, you couldn't get to you know, you write a label, you write a letter to the fan club and they might respond or it would go to, you couldn't get anywhere. But now, you can email somebody, you can follow them on Instagram, you can Facebook, you can see their videos. So, artists are now having a more direct uh, communication mm -hmm. with the fan itself. And I think a lot of, you know, some of the older artists had a tough time trying to, trying to do that. You know, we've seen uh, established artists try to embrace Facebook and Twitter and, you know, what's all this uh, going on. And they're, and they're embracing in the young artists, it's just part of their um, model now, mm -hmm. you know, they're, so they're getting out there. So, um, you know, transparency, crowdfunding, I think there's a lot of amazing ways that artists can, can do that. And, and so they sort of grew up going, well, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if I had a song on radio, but I don't need a song on radio. Um, look, I have all these fans and they just gave me money to make a record. Yeah. You know, I've seen unknown artists that I've never heard of and I look at the, the till and crowdfunding or uh, you know, Kickstarter or whatever it is and they, you know, $300,000 they burn. I'm like, who, who are these guys? Yeah. And then when you sort of do some research on them, you can say, well, you know what, they've been playing in Canada for two years and they built up a following and they released a couple indie records and that's how they did their fan base, sort of a very DIY approach that, um, you know, certainly existed before, but not at the level that exists today. There's so many tools. You know, I keep waiting for you and I to start our band. 
and uh, <laughs> yes. pop it out there, right? Exactly. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you specifically about, because you have a lot of experience in the international side, you've traveled extensively throughout the world, and I'm curious if, if in your travels as a manager, you have found that certain territories in the world are more open to newer artists or specific styles of newer bands than others. Um, well, I think, I think the rule of thumb is pretty much everywhere oh, okay. outside of the U.S. is open to more... Uh, more embracing of, of different styles. I think as soon as you learn to travel um, and you get away from uh, how America consumes and distributes music, um, I think I mean, it's hard to describe exactly, but when you sort of when you go to Europe and England, it's a little bit more old school. People still absorb music differently. They read, they like to purchase, they buy concert tickets. Um, not that they don't buy concert tickets here, but but. Um, I think more people embrace the show where we're, I think in the States everybody maybe saves up for those one or two big shows a year. Right. But when you go to Europe, you can see smaller shows and, and there's more festivals and you can experience, you know, uh, you know, Glastonbury or the download and you can see so many great things. And I think when you go to different countries, they embrace music differently. You know, for example, you know, rock music that's really big here tends to also be big in Germany and Australia. Uh, so, you know, so there's a crossover there. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a, still a huge part of the world that hasn't opened up to Western rock. I mean, you, we find some of our biggest successes still are, are in the former Eastern Bloc and, the, you know, going over to, you know, Estonia and Lithuania and Serbia and playing into these countries that never had Western music and now that it's opened up. And I mean, God knows it's going to happen when people start penetrating China a little bit more. Um, you know, people are doing Korea, people are doing, you know, the Far East in, in bigger and better ways. Um, and I think, um, you know, th if you want to be the biggest band in the world, you have to play the world. You know, and there's, I think there was a, there was a vicious cycle with American artists uh, for probably the 80s and 90s and much of the 2000s where they were so successful here in the States, it was record, tour, record, tour. And very few of them invested time in taking a break and going to South America, going to Europe, going to Japan, going to Australia. And I think now again, that's becoming more of a, of a, of a priority. You know, we're breaking the cycle. We're saying, no, we're not going to make a record for two years because after you tour America, we're going to try to send you to Australia. We're going to try to send you to the Far East. And you have to build those audiences. And a lot of times, you might not make money the first time. You know, you might have to just go in, invest your time and energy, say, hey, here I am, Band X in, you know, Bolivia or Colombia, yeah. and uh, the fans embrace you so that the next time you can set up and actually, you know, maybe make some money that time. Um, and then, you know, distribution is also key internationally. You know, you, a lot of times you sign a label here, but you don't have distribution in Europe or the UK or, or vice versa. Sometimes a band will catch a spark in the UK and get a distributor and then you know the label won't translate to the to the US market so there's a lot of finagling uh, you have to do to sort of get everything firing uh, on on the same cylinders whereas you know probably 10 years ago is a little more um, uh, you know synergistic with labels and I think it's much more segregated now and um, I don't know, where were we going with that one again? No, international, no, yeah. The international we were side, talking so international yeah. side. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but, but, but music fans are everywhere. And, they, and, you know, it's hard because a lot of the bands want their, their, to have success in the States. Right. And, you know, there are thousands of bands that do super great in their own country or in their own region and have never even come here. Um, it, 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 I, I see a, a large block of, of bands like that, like in the gas countries, which is you know Germany, Austria, Switzerland. They do amazing business yeah. in that part of the world, but they can't go to Spain or they can't go to England. They certainly can't come over to the States. And you know, for a lot of bands, that's okay. Same thing with Canada. You know, there's a bit of a stigma with Canadian bands. They do great in Canada, but as soon as they cross the border. You know, they sort of lose a step, and uh, people don't know about them. So it's it's really hard to be you know universally known. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, 
a lot of dedication for, for everybody involved in a band at every level. You know, the manager, the label, the attorney, the agent, the marketing, publicity, if you're lucky enough to have all those. Right. And then there are certainly a lot of bands that are penetrating those uh, barriers without any help at all, you know, and, and so if you can find one of those, you know, as a manager, if I can walk into a situation where, hey, these guys have sold, you know, 10,000 records already and they're playing and they're opening for bands in their, you know, tri-state area or in their province or whatever it is, um, we love that, you know, yeah. because then we can, hey, there's momentum, the snowball is starting to build, here, here's what we can do for you, right. now, you know, because we can't always be there at the inception of, Oh, you know, I discovered Michael Jackson when he was four years old, right, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you can't always be the first there, but if you can, if you can, you can find the moment where there's, uh, you know, sort of a, the inertia starting, then you can, you can build on that as a manager, you know. Let me ask you, the final question is, for artists who are looking for management, what would you say are the specific qualities they should be looking for in a manager? Uh, when they're meeting with somebody, I mean, are there certain characteristics or certain? Say the most that important think, thing is probably yeah. the type of cigar that the manager smokes, <laughs> okay. and if they drive a big black Cadillac. Right. Okay. No. Uh, I and always ask which I, one's pink. I always refer to the Boston lyric from yeah. Rock and Roll Band when he goes, you know, that, that line where he goes, drove a big cigar, uh, smoked a big cigar, and drove a Cadillac car. Man, I think this band's out of sight, right? And right. then they sign him. Um, or sort of a Frank DeLeo type of Michael right. Jackson imagery. Right. But um, for, for artists looking for managers, I think, um, obviously, there's a lot of great managers out there. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of bad managers out there, too. A lot of successful ones, a lot of non-successful ones, and sometimes they don't go together. Sometimes the best managers haven't been that successful yet, okay. or vice versa. Um, but, you know, in, in putting a team together, I think what I found uh, the most success to be, personally, is there's, a, there's an organic process when things really seem to gel properly. Um, you know, it's not forced, you know, you're not, oh, I'm going to go find a manager and you interview every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry in your city, in your town. You know, it, it will come when it's ready. Um, I think as, as a band progresses and, and gains more success and notoriety and spreads its tentacles, people enter the circle, you know, whether it's an attorney or a promoter or a publicist or somebody that knows somebody. It seems to be always there's, you know, you're one phone call or email away from somebody that knows somebody that can get you the right answer. Um, so, you know, finding a manager is hard. I think obviously it's somebody you want to be able to trust that has had some success um, that, that can say, hey, you know, here's what I've done. I'd like to do that for you. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, it could be your best friend from high school that was, you know, your basketball buddy and you don't know anything. And if you tackle the, you know, the, the challenges together, that can also be great. So, you know, there is a one broad stroke answer, but I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very basic, simple answer. You know, common sense is good. I think a lot of musicians uh, and bands try to overthink what needs to be done here. I think in the, in the traditional... Uh, confines of the music business with you know writing recording music making a record touring i mean those are very basic things yeah. that you should be able to tackle with your sister or your dad or your yeah. uncle right uh and we get into more you know difficult things yeah you need to bring people on to explain publishing splits and streaming royalties and you know how to pay your tour manager the right amount of per diem you know all of these things that you know not necessarily the missions don't really know but but they can learn about and uh, you just sort of learn by doing in this business and it's a difficult thing because you can't go to college to learn how to become a successful touring musician or a successful manager. Uh, although there's a lot of great programs out there now from universities that have music uh, business uh, courses and, and credits. Um, you know, I think you and I both grew up not having that available. Right. Uh, you sort of just had to, you know, skin your teeth and, and fall down and get back up again, which is a lot of what this business is about. You know, it's, it can be extremely rewarding and it can also be extremely challenging. And, you know, it's not for everybody. You have to be ready to pull your boots up every morning and go, here we go. Yeah. Very, very much so. Jamie, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Thank Rich, you. thank Appreciate you for having it. me. Thank you. Thank you for doing it.